it's good to be uh, in church on Sunday morning. Amen. Uh, God has given us such a beautiful place and uh, a field to do this in. It's, it's awesome. Well, we're continuing our series in the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, and we're going to start into chapter 6 this morning. And this, this particular chapter is a dynamic chapter uh, from the life of Paul. And um, dynamic, I mean, 2 Corinthians tells us more about the man Paul than any other book in the Bible. And in this particular chapter, we see some of that coming out. Um, we sense more of who Paul is, how he felt in all of his struggles. And, and uh, now chapter 6 really draws this out. Now, at the close of chapter 5 last week, um, Paul describes himself as an ambassador for Christ who pleads uh, to others on God's, have to be re uh, on God's behalf to be reconciled to him. Now, with this in mind, Paul continues into chapter 6 and he makes a special uh, plea to the Corinthian believers. And he starts out by pleading with them not to receive God's grace in vain. Uh, reminding them that now is the time of salvation. So, verse 1 in this particular chapter has been uh, a problematic interpretation, um, but, but verse 1 is, under, is a key to understanding the entire chapter that we're about to uh, get into here. Now, in verse 1 and 2, Paul makes an appeal to the believers not to, to receive God's grace in vain. Now, um, as God's co-workers, he says in verse 1, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Well, just kind of a, a backdrop to this before we, talking, we talk about uh, God's grace in vain. Uh, in this passage, we see that Paul considers himself, along with the other co-workers in the gospel, as partnered with Jesus Christ, as co-workers with Jesus Christ. They're partners with the Lord and they participate with the Lord in the ministry. And what is the ministry? The ministry is that of reconciliation. Now, that is actually when you think about it. Co-workers with Christ, participating in, with him in his good work, in the ministry of reconciliation, that's an amazing job description. It's amazing to think that the eternal God has called little people like us into partnership with him in his good work in this world is nothing short of amazing. And Paul was amazed by it too. And, and God could have done it another way. He could have done it all himself. But just as a good father trains his child uh, for the good of the child, uh, God trains us by letting us participate with him in his work. Now, as a dad, you know, when my kids uh, were little, I get them to help me with different things. And, and one of the tasks that I, I've got my kids to help me with when they're small was to walk with the lawnmower. Now, you've probably had the opportunity, if you've been a parent, to do this, and maybe you've done it too. Um, You'd have them kind of walk with you and you'd, you'd have your hands on the, on the lawnmower handle and they'd walk with you and they'd put their hands lower down on the handle and they'd kind of toddle along with you, right? You had to be very slow, methodical, and careful. Um, you'd go a lot slower than if you did it yourself, right? Um, for the sake of pure efficiency, it doesn't make sense for me to uh, have my child pushing the mower with me. But uh, I want to train my child and I want to teach him. And the best way to train and to teach a child is to have them participate with you. Now God trains us, I believe, by letting us participate with him in his good work. And, and it's good for us to understand that, that God didn't need Paul and he didn't need us to fulfill this role. He could have done it a different way and done it himself, but he does this for the sake of love. Co-workers with the Lord. God's best for us, you see, 
is never just a life of sitting back in comfort, ease, and indulgent activities. God loves us and He wants us to experience the joy of seeing and partaking in the fruit of His labor. And what is this? It's, it's, it's like that child, you know, he's not doing a whole lot in pushing the lawnmower. He's there and he's, and, he's, and he's giving what he has, but he couldn't do it himself, could he? A small child could never do that himself. So, so God, God wants us to participate in the fruit of his labor. And what is the, what is the labor of Christ in this, in this, in this time? Is it not the ministry of Christ? Is it not the granting of sight to the blind? The healing of the brokenhearted? The proclamation of freedom to captives? And release from darkness for the prisoners? Isn't this why Christ was, was in, in the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit lighted on him like a dove? And he walked as an example of living life anointed by the Spirit of God. This is the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus came to the earth to perform. He came to reconcile what was, what was estranged from God, to bring what was broken and make it new. This ministry of, of reconciliation that changed and, and set free Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit is what he is now a co-worker with the Lord in. With such a great calling by God's grace towards us as his children, you see, it's all by grace. It's not something we earn. This isn't something we can work up. He urges, Paul urges the believers in his writings not to receive the grace of God in vain. And what does the Apostle mean when he says this? The very cautioning word not to take God's grace in vain means that it must be possible to take it in vain because this letter is written to the Christians. Paul here, in the context of what is being said, he's not speaking about the Corinthian believers falling from grace. That's not what he's talking about. He's speaking of the possibility that the believers might take the grace of God for granted and that this might cause them to be stunted in their growth and maturation in their spiritual lives and they would not correspondingly have the impact that he desires them to have in working with him in his good work of reconciliation. You see, God's grace wasn't just given to us, and I've said this before, was not just given to us for fire insurance, although that's part of it. Like when you receive the grace of God, you receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Him, and that means the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing of the heart so that your gift in eternity is life with Him forever rather than going to the lake of fire. So that's part of it, but that's, that's just part of it. God's grace is meant to save us from that, but it's also meant to change us, to make us like Jesus Christ in attitude, action, and motive. Now, William Barclay puts it this way. Suppose a father sacrifices and toils to give his son every chance, surrounds him with love, plans for his future and care, and does everything humanly possible to equip him for life. And suppose the son feels no debt of gratitude, never feels the obligation to repay by being worthy of all this, and suppose he fails not only uh, because he has not the ability, but because he will not try, because he forgets the love that gave him so much. That's what breaks the Father's heart. See, when God gives people all his grace 
and they take their own foolish way and frustrate that grace which might have recreated them and caused them to be effective in being a reconciler and taking his message of reconciliation and working with him when they frustrate it rather than treating the grace of God for what it was intended to do to change the heart and life the grace of God becomes like almost like uh, a license to do what you want and be self-focused and self-centered and God desires that we embrace his grace why so that many sons may come to glory so that we might be ambassadors of his grace not just consumers of his grace but ambassadors of his grace and grace isn't given I want to make this very plain because of any of our works, past, present, or future. It's, it, it's, it's, yet it's given to us to encourage us to work. Not to say that work is unnecessary. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that you can't be saved by works, but grace given to us encourages us to participate with God in his good work. It, it drives us to it out of the right motivation, out of the motivation of love. It gives God joy to have us work with him in his ministry of reconciliation. And this is the desire for all of his children. There's no side, side show here. There's no bench warmers in the kingdom of God. Everybody has a ministry that God has called them to participate with him in that, that is flowing into that ministry of reconciliation that God desires bringing many sons and daughters to glory so this is why in verse 2 he says for he says in the time of my favor I heard you and in the day of salvation I helped you I tell you now is the time of God's favor now is the day of salvation very interesting quote of scripture this is exciting to me I'm gonna get into something that's that really makes me jump up and down inside. <laughs> this quotation that I just read here is an interesting choice of Old Testament scripture quoted from Isaiah chapter 49 verse 8. What's really exciting is mining the context of this verse and why it fits so well with what Paul is trying to say here. When you go into Isaiah 49 and you read the first part of the chapter, you find an exciting and profound prophecy about the purpose, life, and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ more than 700 years before his arrival. And I would like to read with you a couple of those verses in context to put this in context ahead of the passage that was quoted here in 2 Corinthians from Isaiah 49 8 so let's look at Isaiah chapter 49 and let's just look at the first three verses and what it says here listen to me you islands hear this you distant nations before I was born the Lord called me from my mother's womb he has spoken my name he has made my mouth like a sharpened sword in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will display my splendor. What a description of the Messiah. What a description of the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't it just resonate the glory of Jesus that's been revealed to us in these last times? Predicted. 700 years before the arrival of Jesus. If you move down to verses 6 and 7, uh, Isaiah continues saying, he says, Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring those back, back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord, the Redeemer, and the Holy One of Israel says to him who is despised and abhorred by the nations, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will bow, will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. What a powerful prophetic word from, of Jesus Christ. The servant king. 
the one who came to serve, yet kings and princes bow down to. The Holy One. God sent Jesus and the Lord Jesus. He was rejected by the nation of Israel. They led him to be crucified. But in the end, the death of the Lamb of God brought justification and reconciliation to those who would believe in him. In preaching of the gospel, Paul seizes upon this marvelous truth that I've just explained to you and announces to his unsaved listeners, I tell you, he says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Salvation has come through the Lord Jesus Christ, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow, powerful stuff, eh? So now the Apostle Paul shifts from expressing an appeal for the believers not to receive the grace of God in vain. He doesn't want them just to receive the grace of God, to be consumers of it, to sit there and bask in it. He, he wants us to receive this gift and give it away. Because the servant king calls his servants to be servants just like he is. So now he shifts from that to participate with God in his plans of reconciliation to describing what servants of God look like practically. And he uses himself and his co-workers in the gospel as an example. And continuing in verse 3 of our text, the apostle Paul writes as he says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Paul realizes that there's always people out there looking for an excuse not to listen to the message of salvation. And if they can find an excuse in the lives of those who are acting as ambassadors for the Lord, it discredits what the church is setting out to accomplish. And he says here, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path. Now, Paul was aware that neither he nor his partners in the gospel um, could live uh, effective lives for Jesus in a state of duplicity. Sharing the message of Jesus on one hand, while on the other hand, living in a way that dishonors and is contrary to the nature and character of the Lord. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, you see, Paul knew that when this happens, ministries for the Lord are discredited and open doors are closed. Paul advises the Corinthians that he has not put any stumbling blocks in anyone's paths. So often, we wonder why many unsafe people turn away from the message we present to them. Now, sometimes unsafe people turn away because... They don't like to hear that they have to give up their sin, right? That's a very common reason for people to turn their back on Christ. The Lord said that people will reject us. They rejected him. They rejected his message too. They said they will. And that's one of the reasons. But there's another reason why sometimes people turn their backs away from the Lord and, and the gospel. Maybe it's because someone has placed a stumbling block in front of them which discredits their ministry and what they have to say. Paul made this point. Sometimes people don't want to come to Jesus because they don't want to surrender their lives, yes. But as an ambassador for God, it is possible for us to place stumbling blocks in people's paths and resultingly discredit their ministry for, for God. Even though the ministry for God is, is powerful, there is a discrediting that takes place. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1 says this, says this, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The scriptures are clear. In, in, in Paul, he has spoken to the church about this matter in other places. Ephesians 5, 15 to 20 says, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled by the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but my sin nature is really sneaky. 
right? I think we can all attest to that. Who here has been fooled by their sin nature, right? We all have. And if we haven't, if we say we haven't, we're lying. Like there's times where we have to be careful. We have to walk carefully. We have to pay careful attention to how we walk. Sin will capitalize on every opportunity that we give it to manifest in us, and it will lead us to duplicity, which in turn will hurt our ministries and our testimony for the Lord, discrediting everything we have worked so hard and that we are working so hard for in advancing the kingdom of God. So we need to follow the example of Paul. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This is an example that Paul gives. The Paul, Paul goes on to describe the way that he sought to carry out his ministry, how he sought to dispense his ministry. The Corinthians were questioning Paul's credibility because there were people that were, were, were back door talking about his credibility. And they were doubting Paul's credibility. But Paul goes on to say this in verses 10, 4 through 10. So rather than, rather than carrying his ministry in a way that there's stumbling blocks and there's discreditation. Rather, he says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad reports and good reports, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beating yet not, beaten yet not killed, sorrowful yet, not, yet, yet always rejoicing, poor yet making rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Wow. This is Paul's statement about how he has sought the Lord and sought to carry himself and has, has been faithful to the Lord through everything that's happened to him. See, the Corinthians were looking at this guy locked up in, in a jail cell in Rome, beaten down, and, and, and they're listening to some people saying, what kind of guy is he? If that's how his life is, what kind of guy is he? Maybe, maybe he doesn't really carry the, the word of God. And maybe we should question the teachings that he's brought. Well, here Paul, Paul focuses uh, on the approved nature of his ministry rather than becoming a stumbling block for the gospel. Paul had determined not to give offense nor reason for someone to reject the gospel of salvation. Although Paul was in that Roman prison and he appeared as though he, he had been through the meat grinder of life, and he had, Paul expresses that he's acted commendably before God through every circumstance that he's faced. Now, God called Paul to be the, the apostle to the Gentiles, and he called Paul to be an exemplary in his behavior, and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This is what he's talking about here. This was expressed in his Christ-like attitude displayed when great endurance was required. There was times when he was tired and he needed endurance. And he had an attitude of Christ in the middle of the endurance. Do you think Paul did this by himself? Absolutely not. The Apostle Paul did not do this by himself. He was in partnership with the Lord and the Spirit of God was in him and filled him and gave him the strength to be a man of endurance. Paul did not give way to his flesh and act foolishly, even though he had to go through terrible times, troubles, hardships, and distresses. He kept his attitudes, actions, and motives right before God, even when he was unjustifiably beaten by those who hated him, thrown into prison by ungodly officials. Paul didn't take the grace of God in vain, even when his stand for the gospel created a stir amongst the people, leading to riots. Remember in Ephesus when the craftsmen of the city who were making a livelihood from creating pagan idols. Remember what happened when Paul was there and he started preaching the salvation message through Christ and people started abandoning their idolatry? What did that do to the craftsmen of the city? They got mad. They got upset. They stirred up a riot against Paul 
saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they, 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 see, this is, these are the things that Paul did in, 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 his, in his ministry. He carried out his ministry in a godly way. And yet we have this thing coming against him. But he kept his attitude straight. He kept his attitude right before God. Being a minister of the gospel was sometimes hard work. Without much compensation, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. He had to, had to pay for his own way sometimes. The circumstances he had to face left him at times sleepless and hungry. Sleepless probably because he was in a place where he was not able to get comfort. I can't imagine those Roman jails were very comfortable places to be. Sleepless and hungry. Sometimes because of fasting, sometimes because of being starved by the, the jailers. Even though these through these times, you see, Paul, he dispensed his calling from God in a way that was honorable without complaining, without giving people a reason to doubt the power of the message that he proclaimed. The power that, had the mess, the, the power had, that, that was given to him by God to change and, and recreate a human soul. Look at, look at all the, the, the things that happened as a result of this great ministry of the Apostle Paul. We're preaching the message here today over 2,000 years later, right? Paul explains to the Corinthians that rather than bend to the pressures faced by the troubles that he encountered, um, he acted in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in his right hand and in his left. Oh. See, Paul had more trials to work through than most men, more than us. But correspondingly, he had more blessings and he attributes his victories and his blessings to the power of God which resided in him in the person of the Holy Spirit. See, we're, we're not left alone, my friends. No matter what we have to go through in life, whether it's calamities of physical nature, whether it's attacks from the outside or from within, we have one who speaks on our behalf, one who comforts us. The Spirit of Christ lives inside of every believer. You are not your own. God lives in you, in the Spirit. Whenever you go through tumultuous times, remember, there is a rock inside of you that is higher than you are. And it's all made possible by the blood of the Lamb, by the sacrificial work of Jesus in giving himself instead of us for cleansing us so that he can make us a place fit for God to dwell. And that is not of ourselves. It is all a work of God's grace. Paul displayed a sincere love for the believers. He didn't just think about preserving his own comforts or agenda. He had a sincere love. He longed to see them liberated by the power of God, just as he had been loved and liberated by Christ on that road to Damascus. When any one of us here walks in sync with the Holy Spirit, what are we going to see? We're going to experience resistance. As believers, we're not in neutral territory. We get put on a battlefield. The scriptures plainly tell us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. And these dark powers long to discredit us and destroy our testimony so that our witness for Christ will be snuffed out, keeping people in the darkness from becoming followers of Jesus. This is the work of the enemy to try and keep people out of the kingdom. And when a man or woman of God submits to the Holy Spirit and steps out to live for God in faith, there will be war, real war, real spiritual war. And the war means that there is going to be a fight. 
And the fight is going to be over whether or not we will be effective in evangelism. But God has given us overcoming power to us in his person so that we're able in his strength to overcome all of the enemy's schemes. No weapon formed against us will prosper. That's what it says in the scriptures, right? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we can be confident of this, that although the enemy comes at us like a flood, we will stand in Christ, keeping our eyes upon Christ. But God asks us to participate with him in the battle. Just as he asks us to participate with him in dispensing the good news of the gospel. What's the devil's scheme? It's to discredit our ministry so that people, instead of being attracted to Jesus through us, will turn away from the message that would set them free. That's what happens when we allow ourselves to be careless. And we're not careful in the way that we're walking. And we become duplicit in the message that we send out to an unbelieving world. On one hand, our testimony preaches joy, peace, and love. And on the other hand, if we yield to the temptations of the flesh, we present gloom, fighting, and self-preservation at other people's expense. As an example of a minister who recognizes what the fight is and what it is and how it manifests, Paul says that he wields weapons of righteousness. What are these weapons of righteousness? In both his right hand and his left, he's completely engaged in the battle, wielding weapons of righteousness. Adam Clark, famous Bible commentator, says this. He says, the idea of on the right hand and on the left is of holding both offensive and defensive weapons. It probably has in mind both advancing and being attacked. Particularly the shield and the sword is what is in the hand, right? The shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. The former on the left arm, the latter on the right hand. We have the doctrine of truth and the power of God as armor to protect us on every side, everywhere we go, on all occasions. God has given us this. And he says, put on the full armor of God. Take the sword in hand. Take the shield in hand. Put on, work with me. Submit yourselves to God. Humble yourselves before the hand of God and he will lift you up. You see, we take up our armor by humbling ourselves before God and bowing before him. You see, we all know this because we all experience it. The true disciple of Jesus Christ is going to experience the mountaintops and the valleys as well as all the territory that is in between those places. It's a life where we do what is right and sometimes we will receive honor and sometimes we will be dishonored by the world when we do what is right. Times where we are understood and times when we are misunderstood. We'll inevitably be at the brunt of both good reports and bad reports. A servant of the Most High God will experience all of these things just as Jesus experienced all of these things. Paul was zealous, but it was not zeal as men under the power of their own flesh are zealous. Paul was zealous in the power of the Spirit for seeing the message of the gospel expressed um, effectively so that people would hear and would become believers. He fought, so what, how did he fight this? He fought hatred with love. He endured persecution with the praises of God on his lips. He was a warrior, but his battle cry was different than the drumbeat of the world. He didn't overcome evil with evil or the sword made by human hands. He overcame evil by wielding the sword of the Spirit and calling upon the Lord. 
and casting his cares upon him and bowing his knee before the Lord and taking his word in hand and saying, change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, make it be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. That's the call of the warrior of Christ. That's the call to battle that Christ calls. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we make captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The arguments and pretensions that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God are meant to try and discourage people from accepting the Lordship of Christ. We're in the fray, my friends. We are in the battle. Indeed, Paul was a warrior of righteousness, but he marched to the orders of his Savior who said in Matthew 5, 38 to 45, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to see you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his shine to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and in the unrighteous. Oh, powerful words of our Lord. Counter to what our flesh would have. The issue at hand in Corinth, you see, was that there were false teachers leading the people astray by their teaching, their polished presentations had given the Corinthians teaching on what their itching ears wanted to hear. Paying attention to the teachings of these false teachers that had come in their midst created a problem in Corinth. And Paul's letters were there to address some of this. See, paying, paying attention to these teachers created a disturbance that undermined Paul's credibility with the church. Even though he and his companions had founded the church in Corinth, and the message of the Corinthians had been that, that they were listening to um, was, was compelling enough to get them questioning whether Paul was a legitimate representation representative of the Lord. So this is what his letter was all about, writing the portion of this letter, was to assure them that despite questioning his credentials as an apostle, his ministry was intact because he was approaching it from the perspective of partnering with God in each and every circumstance. I have learned contentment, he said, in each and every circumstance, whether in hardship or in good times, right? Whether on the mountaintop, on, in the valley, or anywhere in between, I've learned the secret to contentment. How can, can, can we follow Christ by following the example of Paul? I think so. This is written in the Word here for our benefit. Because we need the Word of God. We need the power of the Spirit. We need, we need the example set to, to, to us in this Word. Paul had been faithful, and although he had take, been taken wrongly, his ministry was not discredited. Did you know that if we call upon the Lord to strengthen us and we do the right thing, even when it hurts, that our ministry will remain intact? doesn't mean that we're always going to get a positive uh, reception of our ministry, but our, our integrity, the integrity of our ministry will remain intact, and people will see the light of Christ in us. And they'll come and they'll be saved. And that's what we want. We want to be a church where people come and they see a difference in you than they see out there in the world. They, they need the truth that would set them free in Jesus. So Paul's desire 
for the Corinthians. And, and his desire, I think, for the church throughout the age was that they would not receive the grace of God in vain and, and, and therefore be discredited and ineffective. In this passage, Paul is expressing this so that they will open his hearts to the warnings given. Stay the course on being faithful to the message that was preached to them. The message of Jesus Christ and the apostles is the foundation of the church. Jesus being the chief cornerstone, the apostles and prophets being the foundation layer by which the whole church rises to be a place where God dwells, right? The Spirit of God in the living stones of that building, rising up, giving praise to God, being a place where he dwells. That is the lighthouse that God wants us to be. This is why he tells them in verses 11 to 13, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to, as to my children, open wide your heart also. This message is for us as well. God called us to stay in course with what we've been taught in the foundations of the scriptures so that our witness is not hampered and God desires that we're effective and productive in our knowledge of Christ and that our testimony remains intact and that people in this dark community will be saved by the power of God. Not that we do it, but we wield uh, the weapons of the Lord. You know, the sword of the Spirit, the Bible, is not our sword. It is the sword of the Spirit. It's God's Word. It's God's power that changes lives, not us. But we are participators with Him in His good work. God's given us a sword and a shield, friends. He promises that there is victory on the other side of this battle. Today, my prayer is that my heart would be humble before God. That if there's anything that I need to change, that I would bow the knee of my heart to the Lordship of Christ and say, change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. We can't do it alone, my friends. Our flesh is too powerful. But God is greater than our flesh. And God is greater than any power in this universe. Lives changed and set free by the presence of the Spirit living in us and working through us. This is our call. Amen.